What do George Clooney, hamsters, and fake Rembrandt paintings all have in common? Answer. They're going to help you improve your photography. Hey guys, Ryan here at Signature Edits, and inside this video, we're unpacking a massively cool topic in photography today that I don't think anybody's talking about. And when you actually get your handle, get your handle, get your mind around this subject, it's really going to make a massive difference in your photos, in your composition, in the emotional impact of your work. So what is this topic? It's the science of neuroaesthetics. Now, before you tune out on me, because that just sounds weird and complicated and dorky, it's actually massively important because neuroaesthetics is the science of the brain and aesthetics. Basically, how your brain sees things as beautiful, pleasing aesthetic. What makes something beautiful? And why does your brain respond to certain scenes rather than others? And that's a really interesting question because beauty is not limited to just photos, right? Beauty extends to art. It extends to your girlfriend. It extends to a cat. It extends to the way that somebody does something skillfully. But what makes that thing beautiful? So we're going to look at how the brain actually, actually, <laughs> actually interacts with these different things in the science of neuroaesthetics and how you can take these different uh, ways of interacting with the brain to improve the emotional composition of your work and the impact that your photography has on other people. And that might sound dorky, it might sound silly, but it's actually massively important because really the emotional impact of your photos is the most important thing about them. If you aren't making emotional impact, your photos are boring. They're never going to be good. So if you want to have professional photos that really come across to an audience in a strong way, you need to understand these things. So we're going to unpack 14, 10, four different ways that uh, you can use neuroaesthetics to really improve the composition of your work. Now, without further ado, uh, let's head over to the computer of justice, illumination, and knowledge, and we will dissect this together. Let's go. Okay, so this is your brain. Now, neuroaesthetics is the science of how your brain perceives things to be aesthetically attractive or beautiful. At the end of the day, your brain is less concerned with how things look and more concerned with how things reward it. So basically, whether something is rewarding or non-rewarding. If something is rewarding, your brain is going to perceive it as being beautiful. If something is non-rewarding, it's going to perceive it as being ugly or repulsive. That's your brain's job to keep you safe, to find rewards, and to avoid risks. Now, Neuroaesthetics is looking at the factors that play into this. So let's look at this example here. This is somebody that you just met, right? And on the surface, you didn't find them very attractive. But as you got to know them, you hung out with them, you appreciate their inner qualities, then your brain says, you know what? This person is actually really rewarding to be around. And all of a sudden, that person looks way better to you than when they first did. Now, this might not have happened to you personally and in such an extreme example, but we've all seen those couples where you're like, really him or really her and at the end of the day it's not because visually that person necessarily was super attractive it was because that person was extremely rewarding to be around and be with and so beauty is in the eye of the beholder that person became more attractive to you now that same thing applies to the opposite side of the spectrum with pain so the more painful your brain perceives to be something the more it's going to want you to avoid that thing the stronger the emotional response so you see this guy in the water not going to be such a big deal you see this guy in the water all of a sudden huge pain response you need to get out of there very dangerous highly emotional moment right so massive difference between these two visuals and so we can take that knowledge of pain versus reward and figure out how we can apply that to our photography to improve the emotional response that we get the cool thing about neuroscience is it actually shows us what the brain responds to more deeply so we know from studies that van gogh's paintings activate visual motion areas in the brain so action paintings and action photos actually engage mirror neurons and motor system parts of the brain that's really really cool and handy to know because if you have have photos with action in them, you're going to have a much more effective composition. Likewise, photos with people in them actually engage the fusiform gyrus, which is a part of the brain associated with remembering faces and people. And the spatial parts of your brain are actually activated when you look at a photo of a landscape, simply by adding some motion to your photography. You can improve the way that your brain is responding and deepen that level of engagement. Likewise, if your photo seems a little boring, just try adding a person in there. You'll probably get a deeper response. Lastly, if you have landscapes to show off, those will more deeply affect the brain than photos of just a bland, boring backdrop. 
So do you see why this is so helpful? If we understand how the brain is responding to an image, we can simply give it more of what it wants and our photos are instantly going to be more impactful. And this is really, really cool because in the past, there's been lots of tutorials out there on how to do shutter speed, how to get ISO right or exposure right, you know, the basics of photography settings. But it's really, really hard to explain why something is creatively beautiful and why something is not, why something is impactful and why something is not. Even if your camera settings are correct, your photo might still have low impact. And this explains it. It's the amount of emotional and engagement, the amount of brain activity you're triggering through these different things that's going to create more impact. So we're going to look at 11 more ways we can create impact in the study of neuro aesthetics. But first, if this is helpful for you, do me a favor, hit the like button and leave me a comment below. What are you thinking so far? So first off, let's talk about symmetry. We've known for a long time in art that things that are more symmetrical tend to be more beautiful. But why is that? Well, it's because when your brain is actually looking at somebody, they're trying to perceive, would this person be a good partner? Are they healthy? Are they fit? Are they safe to be around? And symmetry is an indicator of health, whereas asymmetry, if things are off, tends to be an indicator of sickness or disease. So for example, this beautiful model, very symmetrical face, so we'll perceive her as attractive because we find her healthy. That's why when we look at people with the greatest symmetry in their faces, they tend to be the most attractive to us. The same thing actually goes for food. So if you look at food and we've got a uniform color, a nice uniform pattern that's repeated, it's very symmetrical, that food is more attractive. Whereas if the food had mold growing on the side and it was kind of bumpy and it had some spots on it, it's no longer as symmetrical. Those are clues that that food is no longer as healthy. Therefore, it's less attractive. Now your brain is looking for all sorts of clues in this area. Is this healthy and is this good? And so another indicator of health and goodness is saturation in the colors and accuracy of those colors. So for example, foods that are brighter and more saturated tend to look more delicious to us. Whereas if I take the saturation and I take it all the way down and I take the luminance down so it's darker, that's no longer as attractive. You don't want to eat that kind of a food because it might be off. It might not be as nutritious. And so your brain is constantly looking for these clues. Is this person healthy to be around? Are they safe? Or is this person possibly sick? So that's why we're looking for symmetry and why symmetry makes a big difference in your photos. If you can incorporate symmetry, your brain is subconsciously associating this place with greater, greater health, a nicer place to be. So we can find that in shapes. We can find it in repeated patterns. We can even find it in geometry and in color. So simply repeating colors across your scene is going to be way more effective than if you have a whole bunch of colors in your scene. So that can be a very great way to work on your photography and increase the engagement in your brain. For example, let's take a look at these two photos. We've got two photos of shelves. This photo of shelf shelves <laughs> has tons of indicators of this is not a safe, not a good place to be. We've got really, really an ugly composition, which is just throwing me off. There's no symmetry going on. We've got all sorts of different shapes. And yes, we have some repeated pattern with the shelves kind of roughly lined up, but they're not lined up enough to my eye to actually look symmetrical, which more or less just throws me off. We've got mold up here in the corners. We've got garbage and dangerous chemicals on the floor. We've got a dirty sink, all sorts of indicators that this is something I should avoid. Therefore, not as attractive, not a nice photo. Where's this shot of shelves? Much more attractive place, right? We've got nice, bright, saturated colors. We've got beautiful symmetry. We've got a clean floor. And my eye says, oh, this is a safe place to be. This is somewhere I'd like to be. Therefore, better emotional response. So that's why symmetry is such a powerful tool. It's an indicator of health. And if we can keep that in mind, the larger picture of, okay, how can I make this scene appear to be more healthy through both the saturation of the colors, the accuracy of the colors, and the symmetry of the scene, you can improve your compositions pretty easily. Now, the next neuroaesthetic concept we're going to talk about is peak shift, which is super effective when it comes to our photography. Peak shift was first found when they took one of these cute little guys and they showed him a rectangle. Then they gave him a reward and showed him another rectangle. Then they gave him another reward and they showed him another rectangle. After a while, they showed him an even longer, skinnier rectangle. And they found that the rat's brain went off as if it had received a huge reward, even though it hadn't. That's called a peak state. It's an exaggerated emotional response triggered by an exaggerated visual. So for example, if I show you one of these fish versus this shark, huge response difference, even though both swim in the water. Or if I showed you this shark and then I showed you an even larger shark, you would have a larger response. So we can take this and employ it in our photography by looking at our compositions. You can have a photo like this, just a generic field, some nice rolling hills. But if I were to take a telephoto lens and make these hills look closer and larger, that would exaggerate the appearance of those hills. It would make them seem bigger. I'd have a larger emotional response. 
Or if I went to the mountains, for example, and took one of these shots instead, larger emotional response because this is a exaggerated version of this first image. Likewise, if I exaggerated it even more, more response. The same thing would go in the opposite direction. You could take your composition and say, okay, well, I've got a field here. What if I got rid of these trees? Well, we're probably gonna have a stronger composition, stronger response. What if I made it even more barren, even more flat? Probably going to get a better response. And if we took it all the way to totally desolate, that is going to trigger an even stronger response. So we can take this idea of peak shift and apply it to our photos by just exaggerating what is already there, whether that's in the landscape in the background, in the emotions on the face of our subject, or in the action that's going on. Instead of having someone walk, have them run. Instead of having someone dance, have them jump upside down. Now there's another reason that this photo right here is a stronger composition than this one back here. And that's our next concept in neuro aesthetics, which is called isolating to amplify. Now it's been found that the less elements you have in a visual, the more the brain is able to focus on the elements that are there. What that basically means is if there's a bunch of clutter in your scene and you don't really know what to look at, it's a mess, your brain is going to have less enjoyment, which is part of the reason that this photo back here is pretty ugly. It's because we have no idea where to look. There's so much going on. Everything is in focus. Contrast that with this scene. We have a barren landscape, an empty sky, and a single Jeep. Your eye knows exactly where to look. It can focus more deeply on what's going on in this photo. And so we draw deeper enjoyment from it. Now, another great example of isolating to amplify is found in illustrations. So if we have a picture of a standard field mouse here, he's pretty cute. He's got nice little hands, nice little ears, nice little eyes. I like his little nose. But if we look at this mouse here, massive difference in emotional appeal. That's because they've taken those ears and they made them huge. They've taken that big nose and make it huge. They made the eyes huge and the hands huge. All of those things are huge and exaggerated. Whereas they've gotten rid of the fuzzy fur. They've gotten rid of the weird worm-like looking tail. They've gotten rid of the elements that are maybe distracting and less cute about a mouse and just emphasized what they really want to focus on. And we can take that and apply it to our photos. So for example, I love this shot right here. It's a great composition because we're framing in our subject and we have almost no clutter in the scene. Everything in here is done intentionally. Notice there's no people walking around. There's no garbage floating in the air. There's no birds in the sky. I'm meant to look at the center area and that is what I'm looking at. It's a very pleasing image. Whereas this photo right here, and again, a beautiful photo, but there's so much more clutter going on in the scene. We've got people walking around on the bridge here. These lamps are lit up. There's a ton of different textures and everything's in focus. I don't really know what to focus and zoom in on. There's more elements going on and I just don't appreciate it as much as I do this one. So we can take that, apply it to our work in all sorts of different ways by really focusing in and removing all of the clutter, everything except for what you want people to focus on, try and get rid of it from your scene and you'll have a more effective composition. Now, one way to kind of take a look at this is to take a look at different photos of some trees. So I've got this tree right here, this one right here, this guy, this guy, and we're going to see a massive difference in the appeal of these compositions based around these kind of rules that we've talked about so far. So this photo right here, let's talk about what's going on that is right. Well, I think there's not too many elements going on and I know exactly where to focus. That's good. What's not so good? Well, everything's in focus. If this field were less in focus, I would be forced to look at this tree and there'd be less going on, less grabbing for my attention. Same goes with these clouds. If they were out of focus instead of so sharp and kind of, you know, harsh looking, I would have less to look at. Lastly, the colors that we talked about, the indicators of health, this green is just not right. It's not what it would have looked like in reality. And so subconsciously to my mind, this photo is not as appealing. I don't really want to be immersed in this scene. Contrast it with this photo. Now we don't have a massive difference in composition. It's pretty similar overall, but the tree is now front and center and we've removed the distracting clouds from the back background and the grass is taking up less room in the scene. It's still in focus, but really it's just in the same area as the tree. So it's not robbing me from it. There's less clutter going on overall, and so it's more effective composition. But primarily what's going on here is the lighting is much better as well, and the color saturation is better. So we're doing all these things at once. We're isolating to amplify, we're improving our color, improving our contrast, improving our lighting, really framing this up in such a way as to exaggerate the scene. Of course, it's a larger tree, so there's a larger effect. That's the idea of the peak shift and exaggerating that emotional response. Here's an example of kind of the opposite. We've got a tiny little tree and a very large beach, very large scene. Now what's distracting from this photo? We could get rid of this palm tree very easily, even with a spot removal tool, and we would instantly improve the composition of this photo. So when you're taking your photos, just think about stuff like that. What could I get rid of here to make this photo more effective? 
Likewise, we've got a very in focus background, but the tree itself looks like it was out of focus a little bit. So we could emphasize that. We could also make sure that the tree is the brightest and most sharp part of our image. So we could darken everything down and instantly the composition is much better. Here's another tree. I love this photo and I love the fact that this tree is bright while the rest of the image is dark. If it were me editing this shot, I would have maybe made it a little bit brighter in comparison to everything else. If we darkened everything down, I think that's a more effective shot because my eye is now being drawn to the scene we're isolating to amplify. Now we've also got that peak shift because this tree and this jungle is super overgrown, right? We're exaggerating what's going on here. Whereas this tree right here, pretty standard. I'm not going to have a massive response to something that isn't really out of the ordinary and out of the usual. So that's just a couple examples. Here's another one. Great tree. We've got very little else going on in the scene, so it's a super effective composition. Ways to make this even more effective possibly would be to get rid of the grass at the bottom of this scene with our spot removal tool. Now this is not going to work because I'm doing it way too quickly, but I think that might make it even more effective if they just took a second to do that. But I love that shot and the fact that it gets rid of the colors altogether really makes you focus. This shot's an example of a tree. It's massive, but we also have scale because of our model here and we have a person in the image, so it's instantly a bit more interesting. Now, what I don't like about this, the colors are not so good, so we are not really indicating health here. We've got a weird kind of blue person. He's not super color accurate, really harsh lighting. It doesn't look like the kind of scene I'd like to immerse myself in. So we're doing some things right. We've got a peak state being exaggerated, peak shift being exaggerated by the size of this tree. We're isolating to amplify by removing most of the other elements here, but there's still a lot of distractions going on. So overall, it's not as strong of a composition as some of our others. So simply by removing some of those distractions, you're going to see instantly it gets a lot better as far as the composition is concerned. And these things are all actually pretty easy sometimes to do in post. You don't have to do it in your actual photos if your scene isn't perfect to begin with. But mainly this photo, the light would have made a big difference, the white balance and those distracting elements. So this photo here, you can see nothing is in focus. Everything is kind of blurry. And so I have no idea what I'm supposed to focus on, no idea what I'm supposed to look at. And this whole scene is just very busy and very um, unappealing for me. There's no um, isolating to amplify going on here and there's no peak shift. This tree is really just not exceptional from any other tree that I've ever seen. And so my emotional response is just very lackluster to this image. One last one here, this photo of a tree is an interesting tree, but at the same time, I have no idea what the point of the photo is. Everything is in focus, very cluttered. And in addition to that, they've taken the saturation and they've gone absolutely crazy. So things just don't look natural. And when they don't look natural, they don't look healthy. And so they're not appealing to look at. So that's how we can use isolating to amplify, peak shift, color, symmetry, all those things to work together to enhance the emotional impact of our image. The next aspect of neuro aesthetics we're going to talk about applying to your photography is called grouping and interpretive challenge. And what I mean by that is essentially your brain is always looking for patterns and meaning to those patterns. And when your brain is able to look through patterns and find meaning, it's really rewarding. It appreciates the effort involved and the more effort it has to expend to a certain extent, if it can find meaning, it'll find that rewarding. So if we look at our tree right here, my brain is searching for meaning to this pattern, but it's not finding anything. That's frustrating. It's not rewarding. Whereas, for example, we look at an inkblot photo. Now this inkblot has so many interpretive meanings because it's not really anything. It's a symbol. And so my brain is like, what is this? Is it two birds back to back? Is it an insect with little claws? Is it a jack-o-lantern? Is it a fighter pilot from above? I don't know. And so it's very interesting and rewarding for my brain to try and find meaning in this pattern. Same thing goes with patterns in nature that you can try and employ and kind of add to your photography. If you can make the meaning subjective, so that you're actually having to interpret it and your brain has to figure out what this represents, that is oftentimes more engaging than just a simple, standard, boring photo. And I think that's one of the reasons that pictures with people with longer hair, um, more accessories, more layers, more textures going on tend to be more interesting than just a cut and dry t-shirt straight on to the face, short hair photo of a person. It's because that subject has more going on, more patterns in the hair, more different layers and textures for your brain to sort through, find that information, and it's very, engaging as a result. So that's one of the reasons that contemporary art compared to classical art tends to be more engaging on an emotional level. People look at it and they have to actually figure out what does this mean to me? How does this make me feel? What do I find? And what is the purpose behind what the painter has painted here or what the creator has made? So if you want to do this and kind of challenge other people's brains, there's some examples here. So you can challenge the perspective, put things in a different perspective to what people are used to seeing. And it will kind of make your brain work and say, okay, what's going on here? Why does it look this way? 
or this one right here, another example of great forced perspective where things are just different from how you'd normally see them. So your brain has to figure out how is that possible? What's going on? Here's another one that is just interesting because we're looking at something that is not what it appears to be at first. And so if you can do that, if you can have multiple layers of meaning to your images and your brain has to figure out what's going on, it's going to be more rewarding. And this whole concept is called perpetual problem solving. It's the idea that your brain is constantly taking in information and constantly looking for meaning. And the more deeply it has to look for meaning and the more deep that meaning is, the deeper the emotional connection and kind of the resulting connection with that photo. And maybe that's part of the reason that we respond more strongly to photos with people in them. Maybe it's because it actually gives us a more clear meaning and we're able to extract more information from it. So for example, here's a photo of a waterfall. It's absolutely beautiful, but I'm not really able to place myself in the scene as well as if I were to put the people back into the photo. Now I can actually step into their shoes, so to speak, and my brain is able to associate more with it. Now it might be partially that whole motor neuron thing where I'm looking at somebody moving and therefore my brain is activating in the same places as if I were moving myself in this scene. Maybe that's why. Or maybe it's because now my eyes visually have something to find in the scene. I'm able to search and find that meaning in the photo. Either way, it's more engaging to me as a result. The same thing goes for this example photo. We've got a beautiful overhead aerial of a nice road going off into the mountains. But if I actually were to put the car back in this photo, now to me, it has a lot more meaning, both because there's direction and there's motion, it's engaging my mind, but I'm also able to find something to focus in on and my brain finds that and it just is much more pleased than if there was no car. And that leads us to our next photography technique, which is reframing analogy and novelty, which is the process of presenting your brain the same information in a new, creative, interesting way. This can be done in many different ways. So for example, you could take photos from a perspective you're not used to. This is one of the easiest ways to introduce novelty to a scene and kind of make your brain say, what is that? So this photo of water, definitely not what you're used to seeing water look like. So it's interesting, it's new and it's novel. This photo here of a pineapple, presented in a way we're not used to seeing a pineapple, both on a bed and wearing sunglasses. It's also a hidden metaphor because we've got a pineapple, which was meant to live in the sun and is wearing sunglasses inside in the shade. Kind of ironic. Here's another photo showcasing irony. So we've got a guy on a scooter and he's going super fast, which is not something that we associate with scooters. Here's another photo that is open to interpretation and metaphor. And because we've really zoomed in and we've isolated in order to emphasize, we don't have much to focus on except for these shoes and these power lines and this beautiful blue in the background. You can take things and showcase them in a way you're not used to seeing them. Or you can also contrast two different ideas. I love this photo of a, an egg and a CD. Compositionally, I think it's kind of an ugly photo, but the idea is really interesting because you've got a CD which writes information, but you've also got an egg which is actually a chicken embryo. So it's full of information, far more information than the CD can hold. And when you do this, you're actually engaging people on a deeper level than just, oh, this is a pretty picture of a pretty place. You're actually saying something and communicating something to another human being. And it's really cool because you can take two different ideas, like an egg and a CD, and figure out a way that they are actually the same thing. Or you can take two ideas that are taken for granted and turn them on their head or make them totally different from each other and just contrast them in a way that no one's ever thought of before. So for example, let's look at this photo. I absolutely love it of the Virgin Mary in a liquor store. Now on the surface, it's just very ironic. We've got the Virgin Mary, the symbol of purity, in a liquor store, the symbol of impurity, right? So you'd think that it's just contrasting ideas and that's it. But I think it actually goes a little bit deeper because when you think about it, what do people go to liquor for? They might be going to liquor just for recreation or for having fun or for having a nice date night, or they might be going to it because they're hopeless and they're trying to dull the pain. So it could be they're looking for community. They could be looking for release from pain. Well, isn't it interesting that people often go to the Virgin Mary for the same reasons. They might be going to church looking for community or friendship, or they might be looking just to find some answer to fill that hole, to fill that void, and to kind of numb that pain maybe a little bit. So it's interesting that when you get to this point, when you actually figure out a way of going deeper in your meaning, your photography takes on a whole different dimension. And I think that's where it really starts to transition from just photos to actual art. Or maybe it's just a photo of a statue in a liquor store. I honestly have no idea. In fact, why don't you let me know in the comments below, what do you think? Is this photo just an accident or was there intentional irony and metaphor happening here? I would really like to know. And if you haven't, but this video is helpful, do me a favor, hit the thumbs up. Anyways, let's keep going. Next thing we're going to talk about is clear lines of contrast and object separation. Now, what is object separation? Basically, it's the clear separation of the subject from the background or any object from any other object. Our brain, our eyes just don't really like the look of things that are hard to make sense of because they all blend together. So for example, I have a nice bushel of bananas here. Now to me, this composition nowhere near as attractive as this one right here of this single banana 
on a seamless, different colored background. Now, why is that? You could say it's because the banana is nicely peeled, but I think really, other than, you know, the obvious stuff, it comes down to the fact that the bananas are in this ugly basket. And the basket itself isn't ugly, but it's the fact that we have kind of this mess of just yellow, orangey, brown junk going on here. It's not easily separated. There's no clear lines of contrast compared to a different background, right? Here's another example. We've got this nice banana food shot here where we've just got so much brown and so much clutter going on. And then we've got this photo right here of a single banana on a very different, very contrasted backdrop. Visually, this just is much easier to look at. And so your brain likes that, your eyes like that. Let's take a look at a few photos from actual landscapes that we can apply this concept to. So this first photo, we have our subject here in the middle. And ironically enough, he is the least contrasty, least sharp part of the entire photo. So my eye is drawn everywhere else. It's not very nice to look at him. That's because there's not much clear lines of contrast going on around him. He's got a lot of haze going on. So if we were to actually exaggerate the lines of contrast on him, Grab one of these, maybe enhance the contrast, texture, clarity. Okay, all of a sudden, the image is going to be a lot more effective. So here's before and here's after. Now we know where to look. It's very obvious to our eye and we can focus in a little bit more. We could enhance that a little bit more if we had had a lens with a lower f-stop and the background and the foreground were a little bit less out of focus and a little bit darker. So if we were to take the texture down, clarity down, maybe add a little bit of haze. Now it's an even more effective image from a compositional standpoint. Let's take a look at another photo here. So this is a great photo. We've got awesome contrast happening, really great colors. Everything's exposed well. But I think the issue here is twofold. The first is he's wearing a light jacket on the backdrop of a light cloud. If he were wearing a black jacket, it'd be a lot more contrast, be a lot more clear lines. But also, we just don't have a whole lot of focus going on in this composition because everything is in focus and I just don't really know where to look. It's not super obvious. Whereas if I were to Make everything else a little bit less sharp. Reset that, texture down, clarity down, haze down a little bit, and sharpness down. Now it's gonna be a little bit more obvious where I'm supposed to look. We can darken it a little bit. And that's a more effective composition. However, I think it's still, there's too much going on. For instance, this mountain peeking through the clouds over here, it's kind of distracting. My eyes aren't really focused. There's some weird dots going on in the top of this image. So I would fix all of that. But ideally, I think it would have been better just to focus in a little bit more on the actual action. So your eyes were focusing in on the contrasting area like that. Okay, here's another photo of a guy on a cliff. Nice contrast because he's wearing dark clothing on a very white background. Obviously, we've got some flare happening here, so he could be darker. We could fix that, and he'd probably pop off the backdrop a little bit more. Let's give it a try. Schwabbing, something like that. Obviously, I'm using a JPEG photo, so it's not going to actually work very well. But there's before and there's after. So we added a little bit of contrast. You can see it's just easier to see him. It feels better. So that's pretty good. What I really like about this photo is the fact that the composition is so minimal. They've really gotten rid of all the other extraneous elements. So I only look at this gentleman on the cliff and then we've got this backdrop of an amazing landscape. It's much more effective as a composition than this one where we've just got so much to look at. Contrast that with the very last and my favorite one. Two very similar shots. I think this was the same exact location, except for this one, very clear lines of contrast going on. You can see how nice and sharp that is. Actually zooming in, it looks like it's over sharpened. But the point is from a distance, it's absolutely beautiful, really nice, sharp lines of contrast and um, just separation of the objects. So at this point, we've talked about some really handy tools for improving your photography, just based around understanding how the mind works and what it connects to beauty and how you can more deeply engage it through your photography. But one thing that we haven't really talked about is the fact that every mind is different. We all have bias. And until you understand your own bias, the bias of others, and just how that interacts with your artwork and the effect it has, you're not really going to be as effective as you could be. Being aware of things like culture bias really makes a huge difference in how effective you can be with your art. Because depending on the culture you grew up in, you might like radically different things and what you perceive to be beautiful might be totally different from what I do. And likewise, over time, cultures and art styles develop. We all know how fashion changes over the years. So you need to keep up with these things if you wanna reach people in the most effective way possible. Now, another thing to be aware of is things like status bias. You can take a 
an identical painting, an original Rembrandt, and show it to one group and say this is an original, show it to another group, say this is a fake. And the people who see, see the fake will always rate it lower than the people who think they're looking at an original. The same thing goes with fine wine versus cheap box wine. If you actually don't show them where the wine came from, people tend to have very little discernment as to which wine was expensive and which one was not. But if you show people or tell people the price of the wine, they will consistently rate it as higher. So this really doesn't apply necessarily directly to your photos, but it does apply to the way that they are presented. If, for example, you set yourself apart as a high-profile photographer and your branding is high-profile, your pricing is high-profile, people will tend to enjoy your work more and think it's higher quality than the same photographer posting the same work with a website portfolio that was cheaper or prices that were cheaper, that kind of thing. So the way you present yourself really makes a big difference in the way people perceive your work to be. And lastly, we've got to talk about the biggest bias of them all, which is your own personal bias and how that gets in the way of your photography. The truth is that you don't see the world the way it actually is. And what I mean by that is, let's say that I grew up just not liking dogs because I had bad experiences with them. They chase me, they kick me, dogs don't kick me, they bit me, they did all sorts of things a dog should not do. And one day I come across a dog and it might be the cutest thing to you, but I see it as just this scary monster who needs to be run away from. And when you take a camera and you take a photo, most of the time your bias is coming with you. And until you figure out how to detach from that, your photos are going to struggle. When I first started out in photography, I would go out and I'd see something that was absolutely amazing. Let's go back to this tree, for example. Let's say this tree were in my yard. I grew up with it, and I love the way it feels when I'm outside in the scene. So I'm sitting there under the tree. It's cool. It's beautiful. The light is nice. There's a breeze blowing. The leaves are just shaking in the air. There's that nice sound, you know, and I just love it. And I take a photo and I post it and this is it. Now, this photo is not very good. Why isn't it good? because I didn't capture the leaves that were actually buzzing in the air. I didn't capture the feeling of the wind on my skin and the sun as it was just setting over the mountains. I didn't capture all of that stuff I was feeling that was feeding into my bias of this amazing moment. It's just a photo of the actual visuals of that moment. So you need to figure out as a photographer, how do you detach the way you see the world from the way the world actually is? This happens all the time. I'll see a photo of a sunset and the person probably thought it was an amazing sunset because in that moment it was. They loved it. They enjoyed it. Emotionally, it was amazing for them. But the fact is they get back home, they look at the photo and they didn't see the fact that there was graffiti on the wall over there or that there was a dead cat on the road over there or the fact that there was, you know, some weird branches covering up part of the scene or the fact that their lighting was blown out or just the clouds didn't actually look that nice, right? A lot of times your bias gets in the way of seeing what the photo actually is until it's too late or until you show it to somebody else and they say, that's not a good photo, dude. So that is one of the hardest parts to actually figure out is how to remove yourself and remove the bias from the situation and say, what's actually going on here from a technical pers perspective, understanding what other people appreciate about photography. How can I improve the quality of this moment? So that is the biggest form of bias that you've really got to figure out how to overcome and is the trickiest to describe. So now that we've talked about all of this in depth, one at a time, let's take it and put it all together and talk about these different ways that you can improve the emotional impact of your photos. I've got the list here on the right and we're going to go through some example photos and just check off the boxes, see which ones are checked with each image and which ones aren't, what things could maybe be improved about the image to improve the impact it has. So photo number one, we've got nice black and white. Everything is really taking advantage of this whole idea of symmetry, which is great. We're also isolating to amplify. We don't have a lot of distractions going on. There are a few things that could maybe be improved. So for example, I've already got rid of a couple of them. Um, these distracting things on the roof could be gotten rid of very easily. Also, these signs are going against the direction that our man is facing, which to me is a little bit weird. That might be adding interest to the photo or it might be a distraction, so you could play with that. One thing that is definitely lacking from this photo is movement. So if our man was running or walking or jumping or doing something, that would probably make the photo more interesting initially to the viewer. Uh, it does have a face, which is great. Makes it really interesting in that regard. Peak shift, we are exaggerating the feeling of the escalator simply because there's a ultra wide lens being used in this shot. And so that's making the escalator seem a lot longer and a lot larger than it is, which is really cool. So they're doing that. We're isolating. There isn't a whole lot of interpretive challenge here, I don't think. I'm not really finding it that interesting to look at, but maybe there is to you. If you find something, leave it in the comments below. Perpetual problem solving and analogies, I don't really know. I mean, maybe the fact that he's alone. So it is kind of different in the fact that he's alone in a normally crowded setting. So I'll give him that. Reframing and novelty, that's pretty standard. Edge contrast, it is very nicely edge contrasty. The only thing is if the man is the focal point of this image, he should be brighter. So that definitely would have helped the composition overall, I think. 
as if you made the man a little bit brighter and a little bit more obvious. Increase the contrast and the sharpness on him. So there's after, here's before. See your eyes just drawn to him a little bit more and he's a little bit easier to see and make out. So those are the things I would change about that. Cultural bias, reputation bias, personal experience. Well, that may or may not play in. We'll keep going here. This photo, great shot. However, to me, it's initially very ugly. Why is that? Well, I think it's probably because I don't like the color scheme at all. There's a lot of clutter and I don't know where to look. There's no really obvious place for me to put my eyes and that's the main thing that's an issue to me. So if we were to take this and we were to isolate to amplify, the first thing that I would recommend doing if I were this photographer is to have stopped down and then made this brighter in post so that this one area really drew your focus more. Your eyes tend to look at the brightest part of the image. The next thing that I would have done is I definitely would have zoomed in if he had a telephoto lens that would have been much better because then it would have made these mountains seem bigger and less flat. So they would have been closer together. You would have had more layers, but they also would have been um, less in focus. So again, we would have really isolated to amplify. Another thing, we don't have any movement going on, so it's not super interesting that way. No faces. We have a landscape and some spatial activation going on, and we've got some nice symmetry between the mountains. I'll give them that. And it's a great photo. Just, just to be clear, I'm not tearing any of these apart. We're just looking at this list and comparing and seeing, oh, what might make this more engaging from a brain perspective, right? Uh, peak shift, we do have some really nice big mountains compared to your standard sort of mountains. These are very interesting, right? So that's definitely happening. Uh, interpretive challenge. I don't think there is much interpretive challenge to this photo, right? There's not a whole lot of message other than this is a photo. I'm on a hike somewhere. So that might have been nice to figure out how you could do that. Maybe you had an object in the foreground. Maybe you had, I, I don't know, adding a person to this photo also would have made it a lot more effective if someone was walking along this rim or just in the foreground, something like that would make it more engaging, at least for me. Analogy, metaphor, not really seeing that. Edge contrast, yeah, it's okay. I think that's another reason I don't really like this photo is because there's not a lot of clear contrast going on, again, with not guiding my eyes with where I'm supposed to look. So that's that photo. This shot I absolutely love and I think it's so cool. We've got really, really great movement happening here with the birds. Uh, we don't really have any faces, but that's okay. The landscape, spatial activation, yeah, it's a nice wide shot. Symmetry and indicators of health. Well, we do definitely have some symmetry going on here and the colors are really nice and popping and beautiful colors. Contrast to these mountains. These mountains to me are more like sickly colors. They're not really super saturated or contrasty. So I think that's part of the reason I also didn't like it. Of course, when you go like that, it still looks gross. So just gotta figure that out. Anyways, this photo here, we've got those things happening. Interpretive challenge, yeah, maybe there is. What is the meaning of these birds? Why is this bird on the inside of the building? What's going on that caused these birds to fly? I don't really know, it's kind of interesting. Analogy, metaphor, eh, not obvious. Edge contrast, very, very nice edge contrast. Very clear definition between the shapes. Nothing's really blending together. The one thing that I think could be made better about this photo is if we had darkened down these areas in the background, your eyes naturally drawn to the bright parts of the image. And so it's just not necessary to have them in there. It's just busyness that isn't necessary. I think the main focus of the image is up here. And also, of course, if you Photoshopped all the people out of this photo, it would just be that much more impactful because you'd have this big empty space that is normally public and crowded. This photo here, I love, I think it's so cool. Um, I love that this is out of focus. The only thing that is in focus are these two boats. And so it's very obvious where your eye is supposed to go. And there's nice contrast between the edges, really nice harmonious colors going on here. A few things that could maybe be improved. Well, there are these two things on the window here that maybe could be removed. So you could go into the spot removal tool, grab those, get rid of them if you wanted. Maybe we don't have any faces going on in the photo. So maybe if you had a person's shadow or something looking out, maybe that'd make it more interesting. Again, we're not talking about how could this photo be better. We're just talking through this list. What could we maybe add and engage people more with? We've got a nice kind of landscape. Sure. Symmetry, indicators of health. Well, we don't really have indicators of health, but we have a really nice blue ocean. So I guess there's that. And then we have nice symmetry going on here as well. Interpretive challenge, yeah, maybe there is an interpretive challenge here because why is one boat ahead of the other? Are they sailing together or separate? Is there a meaning happening here? And who is looking out of this window? Whose perspective is this? Where am I, right? I think that's kind of cool. There's a lot that has remained unexplained, a lot of mystery in the photo. Okay, uh, edge contrast, really nice. Good, 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 good. So we'll just keep going on here. Now this next photo or series of photos is all of different creeks. 
This photo, very busy, and to my eye, I don't like it at all. It's because I have no idea what I'm supposed to look at. And this ties into that personal bias that we talked about. The idea that I've been in these kind of situations on hikes, I love it. It's amazing being out in the forest, you hear the creek babbling around, there's maybe a soft breeze, you can smell the plants. It's amazing, and you try, try and take a picture, but unfortunately, the photo itself doesn't capture any of those emotions and those other feelings, right? All it captures is the visual, which is very cluttered, not a whole lot of meaning, not a whole lot of purpose. So how could you improve this? Well, obviously we could isolate to amplify. So if we were to use a shallower lens that threw everything else out of focus, well then maybe it would make it a little bit easier to see what's going on. And if we made everything else a little bit darker, a little bit less saturated, of course, your eye is gonna be more drawn to the movement in the photo. It does have movement, which is grace, great. <laughs> Having a face or a person in the shot might add some more meaning or just make it make a little bit more sense, give us something to look at. Uh, peak shift. Well, of course, this is more of just an average stream. It's not an amazing waterfall shot. It's not a huge lake. It's just an average stream, which is part of the reason it's pretty low impact, right? You can disagree. It's okay. Interpretive challenge. Not much to interpret there. I think it's just a pretty standard photo. It's not trying to say anything. So there's no real deeper meaning, so I'm not super interested in it. Now let's look at a few more shots of creeks just to compare what else is out there. Now, this photo of a creek, much more effective in my opinion, because we don't have as much going on. We've isolated to amplify, which is really, really great. The other thing is we have some nice movement, like pretty much every creek, but I'm not loving this foliage in the top. I think if they had just cropped in, used a tighter lens or gotten a little bit closer to the action, it would have been more interesting and also more focused. So that's what I would change. Also, they could amplify this movement or add a different per perspective, perhaps, by getting a little bit lower to the water itself using a water lens or water lens using a wider lens or shooting underwater all those different things that could just make this photo more interesting let's look at this one right here again we've got a really busy photo super harsh light and super really disgustingly saturated greens in my opinion now the thing is that greens on your camera tend to just not be that accurate overall i find they never look the way they should in real life most of the time they need to be desaturated and taken down once we do that, you find that we have much more focus on our creek. Here's before and here's after. Now my eyes know where to look because the creek is the bright part of the image. The other thing they could have done, used a shallower lens. So we'll just reset this. We'll make this kind of hazy, right? If they had darkened everything else down and made this part more in focus than the rest, our eyes would again be drawn just by isolating to amplify. Again, these are all just photos of creeks, so there's not really much going on in the way of deeper meaning, metaphors, reframing, novelty. This is a pretty standard view of what I would expect to see if I were just out on a hike, and that's why it's partially not that interesting. There's not much going on, there's no peak shift, so those are ways that this could be improved. Whereas if you contrast it to this photo, the reason this photo is more beautiful is partially because it's just more unique. How often do you go on a hike and see a spot like this? Not that often. Also, we've got this really nice, beautiful, flowy state of the water that's being done with a slow shutter speed. See my video on shutter speed and camera settings if you wanna learn how to do this kind of thing. But that just makes it more interesting to my eyes. It's new, it's unique, it's novel, it's presented in a different way. And we've got some nice symmetry between a waterfall here, repeated waterfall up there, really nice, beautiful, healthy color in the water down here. So there's a lot being done right here. Obviously, there's no faces and there's no people. So that's not necessarily adding to this photo, so that might be an option. Um, there's not a ton of metaphor or anything like that that's being added, but we do have some novelty in that it's not often you see a photo like this, and that's not how your eyes would see it, so it's kind of cool. This photo right here, probably my favorite shot of a creek because it's very, very uh, exaggerated, right? We have a huge waterfall, set of four or three waterfalls. We've got really nice symmetry happening here, just with the nice leading lines. We've got a lot of motion because the water's moving very quickly, obviously. And we've got some really great greens. They're not as saturated. My eye is naturally drawn to the waterfall, so that's really great. Metaphor analogy, maybe not. One thing that could be improved, or at least would make this photo more interesting, was if there was a person up here, maybe climbing the waterfall, kayaking down the waterfall, right? All those things might not be doable when you're out on a hike, but it's just an example of what might make this even more engaging to your brain. Okay, let's look at some food photography because I think that's a great example of how you can apply these principles. So this shot here, absolutely beautiful. What I love is you've got really nice symmetry. You've got symmetry in the colors, you've got symmetry in the pattern of these oranges. And I love that your eyes are actually drawn towards the center of the photo because it's the busiest part of the photo and it's the brightest. So because of that, you know exactly where to look. It's the brightest, but it's also the busiest. And it's kind of where all of these different colors culminate and work together. It's an amazing food photo. I wish I could style things like this. Contrast it to this photo right here. You have no idea 
really what to look at. There's one spot of the photo that is in focus and maybe it's a little bit brighter, but really the brightest part of the image is right here slash on this bowl back here. There's not really nice symmetry happening. There's not a lot of nice pattern. There's just some gross looking kind of textured stuff, right? Even though I'm sure the food itself looks pretty healthy and delicious, it's not visually appealing. And that's because we don't have really nice colors working together. We've got this busy shirt in the background, a lot of dark contrast down here. Right? It's not really following any of these principles. Movement, not really present in shots like this. Faces, not so much. Landscapes, not so much. Symmetry and indicators of health, well, we talked about that. They're not really there. Um, even the colors themselves, if we were to make this a little bit more saturated, we'd instantly make this more appealing. So something like that. So here's before and here's after. Look at what a big difference that makes and how much more appetizing the food looks. Now, the lighting is also really harsh. I don't know. that. That's another thing that maybe could be improved. Isolating to amplify. Again, if we were to focus on just one part of this food, but generally with food photography, you want everything that is there to be in focus. So you can actually tell what it is and how it's working together. So that's that food shot versus this food shot. Definitely better. But again, if your focus is the food, why would you have the sharpest part of the image be this cup up here? And also kind of that's where my eyes are being led by these different lines. So we have some nice things happening here. We've got nice healthy looking colors, but really if you were to take this photo and turn it into this, I think it'd be more effective as a composition. If your purpose is taking a shot of food, of course you would have to compensate. It's not too bright and it's not very sharp. So you'd have to fix all those things, but that's the main difference here. I think there's just too much going on and it's not really lending itself. It's not working together. This photo, love this shot. Now we don't normally see purple bread. So what's interesting is this still looks good and delicious to me, even though the bread is purple and a different color. That's because all of these colors are working together in harmony. All right, lastly, let's just look at some portraits together and compare the different ways that maybe these things could be enhanced or added in each shot. So this portrait, really great. We've got a nice up close of a face, great expression. So that's really good. One thing I'm noticing is there's not a ton of symmetry going on. So we've got different um, plants in the background that are kind of distracting. So we're not isolating as much as we could. And we don't have a ton of contrast in terms of these edges between her hair and the background. So if you had just pivoted your camera a little bit slightly so that behind her was this nice green canvas instead of this bright area, you would have just solved that problem. She would have stood off the background much nicer. Also having this tree and behind her just kind of growing out of her head is rather distracting. So getting rid of that would have been nice. Another thing that they definitely maybe should have paid a little bit more attention to was the green cast of the color. It looks like this photo was taken around sunset and the light was bouncing off all of this green plants and onto her face and just giving it a bit of a green, less healthy, contrasty look to it. Okay, um, the moment, there's not a lot of movement. Maybe you could have added a little bit of a fan on her hair, a little bit of lift, a little bit of extra energy, but that's that. All right, this photo here, great shot. We've got nice symmetry. He's right in the center of the, center of the frame. We've got really nice movement going on. He's in mid stride or something. We've got interesting layers and all of the colors are kind of working together. Huge contrast compared to him and the background, which is great. Things that could maybe be added is you could isolate and amplify a little bit more by removing things like this plant. So you could get rid of the palm tree, just Photoshop it out. This is a really bad job, so don't pretend like this is me trying. Um, you could get rid of these other elements in the background and that would have just made it that much more interesting, I think, as a shot if there wasn't all of this stuff going on in the background. Something like that. So there's before, there's after. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you like the palm tree. Depends. Um, analogy, metaphor, not much going on there. It's just a standard hit shot. So again, you don't have to worry about having all these in here. It's just different things that can add and aid your photos. So. Okay, this photo, love the colors, love the color scheme. I think it's a little bit busy because it's not quite as shallow as I'd like it. So one thing is they could have used a slightly more shallow lens or they could have in post just darkened down things a little bit more. So your eyes were naturally drawn to her and made things in the background a little bit less contrasty, a little bit less sharp. So here's before and here's after. So we just are drawn a little bit more towards the center of the image. Once you're aware of these different things, you'll be able to really improve your photography through both compositions that engage people more deeply and just being more aware of how to communicate with other human beings. I think it's pretty cool and really, really helpful. So I'm excited to start incorporating more of this intentionally into my work as I go forward. So there you have it, 14 different ways that understanding neuroaesthetics and the way that the mind works can really help you engage people on a deeper level and make your photography have a greater impact. It's going to improve everything about your 
your photos. Now, if this video was helpful, do me a huge favor. Can you give me a big thumbs up? Make sure to please also leave a comment below because it really does help the YouTube algorithm and I'd love to get this video out to help more people. And if you want more content like this, make sure to let me know and hit the subscribe button plus the little bell icon thing so that you stay up to date when a new video comes out. All right, I'll see you in the next video. And until then, go create something awesome.